Let's get you to your top five takeaways here, Rod. We'll start you with Micah Parsons. That was one thing that stood out from Football Night in America. As you said, right now he's your defensive player of the year. Granted, that was before Monday Night Football. What is it that's separating him in your eyes? Listen, he's a rookie. And when you come in as a rookie, your head is spinning around, right? You're, first of all, he's the first round draft choice, so he's trying to come in and trying to establish himself in the locker room. And then all of a sudden, the first week, we were there in Tampa Bay. What did they do? They threw him at linebacker. They threw him at defensive end. Yep. He is a rookie, and he's trying to come in and learn one position and do it extremely well on a high level. But now they have him learning multiple positions, outside linebacker, inside linebacker, defensive end. He's in the A-gap mugging. He's dropping back 30, 40 yards in coverage. I mean, what other player in the National Football League is doing what he's doing? And that's all I'm saying. I, I said it Sunday night, but no one's, and this kid is only getting better. Just think about the more reps he's getting. He's beating people, nat natural athleticism. He runs a 4-3. I mean, at 235, 40 pounds, man, this dude is an absolute mm. animal. You cannot tell him. I don't care about Aaron Donald, Matthew Judon. He's been one of the best. But at the end of the day, this is my defensive player right now. Now, people are starting to compare him to Lawrence Taylor. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go there. Lawrence Taylor was just something different. But this kid is absolutely special. He's humble, and he wants to continue to get better. Yeah, I don't think you can go there yet. I, I appreciate you pumping the brakes on that. But but I'm with you, and it's not right. only right now. It's not only currently in the NFL nobody's doing what he's doing. I'm thinking back a decade. I'm thinking back a couple of decades. I can't think of another name who can play this many different positions and play all of them so effectively. And what he does most impressively in my eyes is that he closes the gap so fast. I mean, how many times do you see a quarterback standing there and Parsons has a free rush at him? And before he can even make a decision whether or not he wants to juke him out or throw it away or throw it to some receiver, he's getting hit. He closes the gap with that 4-3-9 speed, and it's problematic. So he's 10th right now in pressures, even though he doesn't rush nearly as often as most of these pass rushers. Fifth in quarterback hits, seventh in sacks. He's got 12 to his name. And this may be the most impressive thing that I saw. 25.2% win rate as a pass rusher. So over a quarter of his snaps when he's rushing, he wins. And that's what it looks like when you're watching him play football. It's just pure, sheer dominance. Who else would be in that conversation with you? Matthew hold on, hold on, Judon's hold on, hold on, name you've been circling on. around for a while, too. Go ahead. What you got? Hold on. Uh, think about the impact on his teammates. Because when you come in as, as a young player, you have an impact. And guys are raising their level of play. Guys are flying around. You know, guys are getting better yep. because of Micah Parsons. Yep. Because they see his level of preparation. And think about this, too, Dan. When you're playing linebacker, when you're playing defensive end, when you're playing all over the field, you got to be smart. You got to be smart. You got to be able to know all the checks, all the adjustments, all the games. If he's playing defensive end, if it's an ET, an end tackle um, stunt, he has to know that. So he has to know multiple positions and all the intricacies of that. It's very difficult to do. And man, and, and think about this too. Offensively, if you're an offense, you look and you're trying to identify, well, is number 11, is he the mic or is he the outside linebacker, or is he playing defense end because he's moving all over the place? So it, it, it constantly causes chaos and confusion to the offense. It's, it's very difficult to deal with when you got a guy like him. It is, and you don't see any of the others pass rushers making as many tackles as he is. That was the other thing I was looking at. They're all in like the 20s or the 30s, maybe the 40s high end. He has 75 tackles this year. So that points to his versatility. 17 tackles for loss. The only guy I saw above him on that list was That's Nick Bosa. So he's second in the entire group there in three forced fumbles. So he's just one of those players that just creates havoc. No matter where you put him, he is a havoc creator. And I got to say, I am right there with you. As it currently stands, Defensive player of the year, although Aaron Donald made a heck of a case last night with those three sacks. Go ahead, Rod. I want, I want to ask you a question because I know everyone's pumping Tom Brady up, and deservingly so. But do you think we can actually slide a defensive player over there in that conversation? And, and could he po potentially be mentioned as the MVP of this league? Because to me, I, I think what we're seeing from Tom Brady, we're kind of used to seeing. But for him to be a rookie and as bad as – Dallas defense was last year as poorly as they played as inconsistent inconsistent as they played this guy single-handedly comes in here and he just changes the whole tone of this defense so I'm almost thinking that this kid is playing so well depending on how he finishes out I think he's gonna finish out great I think you could put him in that category as possible MVP too, right under Brady 
Uh, I'm with you. It's all a matter of perspective there. Because once, once you put the word value in, because then it gets down to positional yes. value, at least in my opinion. And the quarterback position is so much more valuable than any other position on the field. I mean, quantifiably so, that I don't know if I can make that full push to put him over the top of a Brady or some of these other great quarterbacks that we've seen. Even Aaron Rodgers playing at an MVP level here lately. I don't know if he's more valuable but in terms of what he's done this year, I think he's a perfect fit for Defensive Player of the Year. Let's go to your second on your top five takeaways here, Rod, which is defense. And I think this is really a cool point by you. As these defenses sort of develop on the fly throughout the course of the season, that's what we've seen. Who are some of these championship defenses as we're now through 14 weeks? Well, I have them written down, and I'm going to start with the Chiefs. I, I just think the Chiefs, they got to a point where they had so much success. Their offense was so good. They got lazy. They took their offense for granted. Yeah, they had some, they had some injuries, but Chris Jones, he has come in, and Melvin Ingram, they've just absolutely just changed this defense. When you're getting pressure from the exterior, from the outside, and the interior, and now you're forcing turnovers. Tyron Matthew, he's been making plays. And we saw this, we saw this group a couple times this year. They're starting to fly around, they're starting to trust each other. And William Gay, middle linebacker, his speed has been just awesome from sideline to sideline. It is, and you're starting to see all the pieces come together at once. I mean, I was looking at what the secondary's been doing. Juan Thornhill really been playing well. Tyron Matthew, we just talked to him. He's the leader, right? He's the vocal leader that's passing all this knowledge down to the rest of the guys. Mike Hughes has really been having a good year. And Trevarius Ward is their other cornerback who's been playing well. Then you go to their nickel, Rashad Fenton. He's the third highest graded nickel Love defender him. in the entire NFL. Yes. So how many defenses can you look at that have three premier pass rushers and five very capable, very well, you you know, playing very well at the defensive backfield? That's a great combination. Linebacker is not exactly the most valuable. If you can crush up front with the pass rush and the back end, that's how you play some really dangerous defensive football. And a couple more teams that I'm very familiar with, at least the, the, you know, the coaches. I will go with New England and Matthew Judon. And you said this best. And I remember you saying this on Sunday. And I thought this, I, I didn't, really didn't hear this. He is the best free agent of the year. He's the best free agent. Best free agent pick up of the year. I just think that he's been outstanding. Yep. Matthew Judon definitely deserves to be in that conversation. Also, you look at the Tennessee Titans. And their defense has to be good because Ryan Tannehill's up and down, inconsistent. They don't have Derrick Henry. They're two stud wide receivers. They're constantly injured. So you don't know what you're going to get. So Ryan Tannehill needs to be able to depend on that defense to help carry them. But also, this is my last one, the Green Bay Packers. I couldn't be more impressed with the Green Bay yeah. Packers. Their special good teams, one. they need some work. But Joe Barry came in. He simplified the defense. He says, look, I don't want to give up big plays, miscommunication errors. We're going to simplify the defense. We're going to let our defensive ends, Rashawn Gary, um, defensive tackle, Kenny Clark, Devondre Campbell, that front seven, go take over, and they've been phenomenal. I mean, Devondre Campbell, he's come in. He's stabilized that defense. He's been awesome for him, and he's on a, only on a one-year deal. He's going to get paid. What about their secondary, Jack? I know you like this secondary. That's, that's, a great, that's a great, great point. Rasul Douglas, NFC Defensive Player of yes. the Year, right? He's the first one that's done that since Woodson, since Charles Woodson. So of, the week, of the week, of the week. keep saying the year, of the week. Of the week, of the week, of the right. year. Listen, it, it might as well be at the year with the pick six he's <laughs> stacking up at this point. And then you get Jair Alexander back. Imagine that. When he comes back for this team, Zadarius Smith comes back. How about David Bakhtiari comes back to help sure up the left side we of the offensive pro. line? This is going to be a championship-looking football team, isn't it? I know we got one with the Bucks, but look at the NFC. It's the same two teams, Green Bay and Tampa. They're coming together at the right time. No question. And if they're getting healthy, but the big question goes back to Aaron Rodgers' big toe. He comes out, he says, oh, the big toe is not going to be a problem. But then yesterday he talked about, or the day before he talked about yesterday, how sore it's going to be. So you never know right, with these right. turf toes and things like that, but – Basically, their success on offense is going to come down to how healthy Aaron Rodgers feel. Well, I could talk defensive football all day. We got to spin it back to offense for your third takeaway from this Sunday, which is Josh Allen. You can watch that game, and we've been watching it really throughout the course of this whole season. Man, they ask him to do a lot. How much is too much there for Josh Allen, though, Rod? Yeah, I mean, I watched the game, and he's 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 absolutely fantastic. When you see this kid, the heart, and just – 
how tough he is and type of hits that he takes mm -hmm. and the type of coverages and the blitz and the blitzes and all the different packages. But man, this dude is tough as nails. He said, look, forget about everything else. You're not gonna run our running backs. I'm gonna take over. I'm gonna take over this game. Dawson Knox, he's been a huge plus for these guys. Coming back, big target with soft hands. But Josh Allen is that dude, man. And Gabriel Davis, he's coming along. I, I think they need to give the ball to Gabriel Davis more, man. When I was out, he's a big dude. He's got, yeah. he's got really good hands and he loves playing football. So. Um, they need to get back to running the football. I don't know what's going on with Brian Dayball. I know you have this stud quarterback, but you got to take some pressure off him, alleviate some of that pressure, and run the football. At least try to run the football. It's a it's a great point, and they don't have many awesome options out of the backfield at running back. It's a point that we've covered, but when you look at the first half of that game, here here was their entire running attack. Right? It was Josh Allen, four attempts, forty three yards in the first half. Not a single receiver or running back had a carry. So it was just Josh Allen. And when I look at Dayball, this was an okay plan for the big games, right? For the big playoff game, for the must-have game to get into the playoffs maybe at the end of the year, maybe for the Super Bowl plan. But you can't take Josh Allen and make him your number one running option for an 18-week season and then expect him to get you to the Super Bowl on top of that. It can't be one design run after another. He's already going to do enough extending plays, scrambling, making plays on his own. You can't design all these plays and have him get all these extra hits. Already look at a guy like Lamar Jackson. He's beat up when the Ravens need him for a playoff push. I just feel like it's way too risky of a strategy. So I don't care if you need to grab a free agent running back. If you like one of the guys on your practice squad or on your active roster, you have to start handing them the football or else Josh Allen is not going to make it for the long haul with how talented and how great that he really is. Two things that keeps you keeps you really actually keeps you from going far in the playoffs, the inability to run the football and the inability to stop someone yep. running the football. And those are the two issues that yep. Buffalo has. You think about what teams are doing. They're coming in there saying, look, not worried about you. You soft. You got great quarterback, but you're you're a soft team. We're going to run the ball down your throat. The New England Patriots. That was a flat out embarrassment. And that's why um, Sean McDermott. He was so upset because he knew that he got embarrassed on national television. So you got to be able to stop the run and you have to be able to run the football to really show how tough you are. And it was a really impressive come from behind performance by Josh Allen to get him back into this game, ultimately to get this game into overtime. But when you watch the game play out, I mean, this was a substantial lead going into halftime the Bucks had. It was a substantial lead even going into the fourth quarter they had. So it took miracle plays to get them back in it. But in reality, I think Tampa's a, a better team than they showed against Buffalo, specifically in that second half. It, it was pretty cool to watch Tom Brady go five wide and spread it out. And then before you know it, He's got Fournette in there, and it's the power running game. It's just the multitude of different ways that their offense can attack you. And then defensively, I thought they did a better job than anybody I've seen, particularly in the first half, of getting multiple guys around Josh Allen. If you just get one or two, he can make defensive ends miss. He can stiff arm guys and break tackles. But when you get three or four guys around him like they were doing, you can get some really big hits in on Josh Allen, and that seemed to be affecting him. I thought Todd Bowles really did a great job in the first half. Yeah, it fell apart a little bit in the second half, but Todd Bowles – very creative with those pressures in the first half and they were getting home. Yeah, and also what he's dealing with is he's dealing with defenses that are kind of playing like they're, they're playing Patrick Mahomes too deep. So the, the one thing I would say about Josh Allen, if he can exercise a level of patience when he sees those two deep safeties, and he can just stay right. patient and nick and knack right down the field, dink and dunk right down the field, then what happens is people get tired of that. They say, well, you know what, we're tired of that coach. It's like, can we play some man? Can we play some three deep? And then all of a sudden, you get those opportunities, man-to-man -man coverage. Now you can take your shots down the field. But Josh, the biggest thing for him is he has to just show a level of patience, check the ball down, and just truly take what the defense gives him. That's what he needs to do. It's a cliche, but it's, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Let's spin you to your fourth takeaway. We'll keep it with the quarterbacks. We'll keep it with some of the best offenses. And it's Green Bay. We just came back from Green Bay for Sunday Night Football. The Bears gave them a little tougher game, a little tougher test than maybe we were thinking going into it. Really got out of the gates well, did Chicago. But I want to focus on the head coach, right, and Matt LaFleur. Because they have won a whole bunch of football games with him there in town. He flies a little under that A-Rod radar. I understand that. But how valuable really is he in your mind's eye there, Rod? I, you know what I think? I think the one thing that I see from him, and I see that calming presence. I mean, think about, 
I mean, to be able to deal with Aaron Rodgers on an every single day basis, all right, dealing with him in the yep. meetings, in the locker room, you're dealing with such a unique personality and such a like a such a special person. And he has he has what it takes. He has the demeanor. He's calm. He's patient. He's open minded. And the fact that he's got AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones rotating, keeping those guys fresh and healthy. I think he's done a great job. His patience level, just everything that he's done. I mean, you can almost put him in the coach of the year situation because I mean, he's dealing. He he dealt with so much, and he's keeping everything under control. Props to Matt Lafleur, man. He's doing a great job. It's a really good point because he never really gets a ton of credit. It, it, whenever everything is going great, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers gets the credit. But when things are going bad, right. he's quick to get the blame, right? I mean, so he comes in year one, and everybody's going, LaFleur, he's too young. You can't make him the head coach. 13-3, and three, goes straight to the conference championship game. And then they draft Jordan Love. And then you got Rodgers going, you know, four fingers deep on, on the whiskey there, right? So then you, you tick off Aaron Rodgers. They come back the very next year. It's a motivated A-Rod. He goes to win the MVP, 13-3 and three conference championship game again. Then this year, you don't even know if Aaron Rodgers is going to show up. I mean, you have the whole offseason where he's in Hawaii and you don't know. He's asking for a trade. Who the heck knows if he's even going to be the quarterback? Look where they are, 10-3, and three, number one seed right now in the NFC, just overtook the Cardinals. So I think you have to give some credit to LaFleur, and I think he'd be getting a ton of credit if he had just been able to clear that last hurdle. But that's what the whole entire thing comes down to now for the Packers. They have been circling for years now a trip to the Super Bowl again for Aaron Rodgers, and they just have to clear most likely the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, potentially the Rams, in order to get back to the Super Bowl. Yeah, and think about what Matt LaFleur did, stepping up, changing defensive coordinators, Joe Barry, and give it, and, and really giving them stability on the defensive side of the ball because last year their defense was so inconsistent, giving up big plays, you know, um, broken coverages. It was just a mess. And when he's come in, he's really solidified this defense, and this defense is a defense that can actually carry and help carry the offense. There's going to be times if Rodgers not feeling well where – Maybe the offense is stagnant like it was when we were out there early on. And then all of a sudden now the defense can create a turnover. They can get a couple stops. And that's what you need. You need guys like Rasul Douglas, Adrian Amos, those guys creating turnovers and making big plays. Right, and he hires the defensive coordinator, and that's work. So you have to give more credit for Lafleur <laughs> there, right? That's right. I, I really like your point, too. He, he does a good job of balancing A-Rod's ego and A-Rod's knowledge that he's acquired which which is so much right he knows way more than your average quarterback but he's given all of that a little bit of structure and i think that's that's a delicate balance and that's an art form so his ability to do that is pretty darn impressive let's get you to your fifth takeaway it's a team that really doesn't have a quarterback and really doesn't have a solution at quarterback moving forward at least doesn't appear that way but kamara is back for the saints what does he bring most Man, he's bringing a sense of urgency, man. He's playing with that energy. He's their best playmaker, and he was outstanding, whether it's running the ball in between the tackles or really what he does best is catching the ball out of the backfield. And they might, they might right. have to utilize him a lot more in the passing game when they're playing against Tampa Bay coming up this week, um, this Sunday night. So, But I, I like what Alvin Kamara has been doing. Um, I mean, obviously, he's been hurt. He looked like he's fresh. He's got fresh legs, so... We'll see if it can continue because he hasn't met a defense like this recently that um, that he's going to see like Tampa Bay. That's right. Missed four weeks with knee and hamstring issues. Let's take a look at the numbers real quick with what the Saints have been doing. So this is with Taysom Hill and with Alvin Kamara. So look at those touches right there for Kamara, Taysom Hill, right? Taysom Hill is not going to be somebody like Brady who's going to drop back and beat you with 30 pass attempts a game. So he's going to need a Kamara type where he can just dump the ball down to. He's going to need a strong running game. If they're going to have any chance, I, they are going to have a serious headache on their hands heading into Tampa with a team who's going to be ticked off that they just let the Buffalo Bills back into that game late to go into overtime. Yeah, you better expect, you know, the game plan from Todd Bowles is he's going to load that box. He's going to make sure that they don't get off, you know, running the football, and they're going to try to make Taysom Hill beat him, make him one-dimensional, 
tight man-to-man coverage, force Taysom Hill to throw in those tight windows. That's what you want to do. And I'll tell you, when he's running around, he's going to get a big taste of Levante David, <laughs> you know, Devin White. Those guys, man, they, they fly around. They're big. They're thick, just like him. I can't wait to see it. But he's, Taysom Hill is going to have to drop back and make some passes. He can't just run his way to a victory against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.